Welcome back everyone, how's it going? Today I'm talking to Nick from Wicked Wildlife on all sorts of things to do with YouTube and educating the public on our wild animals here in Australia. So Nick's great, he's got a great YouTube channel, really conservation based and puts out some really good information. So how's it going Nick? Welcome to the show. Ah, thanks for having me Cooper. It's uh, yeah, good to talk to another YouTuber about wildlife and reptile. Absolutely. So you run Wicked Wildlife. So what exactly is Wicked Wildlife? So mostly what we are is a, is a wildlife demonstrations business. So uh, we take native Australian animals, so not just reptiles. We've got a lot of reptiles. Uh, but we take, you know, pythons, crocs, venomous snakes, wombats, possums, birds, uh, to schools, birthday parties, kindergartens. Um, and we do a lot of agricultural shows and snake safety. So pretty much wildlife education and, and snake safety are the mainstay and then of course we do our youtube videos on top of all that with his youtube videos guys make sure you check him out he's got an awesome channel and some really cool topics he discusses and i like his uh, i really like his opinions on a lot of things he's he's very fair i think to a lot of different uh thoughts in on different topics but um yeah he's got some really cool stuff dispelling a lot of myths out there in the world like what's well what's one of the main myths you'd say you hear about reptiles for example oh well like i suppose i'm based in the country which you know, anybody who watches this probably knows so we hear a lot of snake myths you know snakes chasing people and i used to work in north queensland so it was uh venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes crossing and things like that so yeah. we try and tackle lots of myths in our, our videos as well as just do general topics like we'll do species spotlights and stuff like that as well mm. And how important is like the, uh, the conservation side to us? I know you, you bring a lot of it back into con conservation and, you know, protecting wildlife and all that sort of stuff. So is that like a main sort of thing uh, in your sort of public displays and stuff? You, you talk about that sort of thing a lot? Yeah. So, so like, I don't really describe myself as a reptile person. I, I call myself a wildlife person. I was a yeah. zookeeper by trade. Uh, and I've always sort of had this opinion that if, if we're going to keep uh, animals in captivity, we should sort of feel obliged to get a conservation message. So, um, you know, I try to be entertaining, but only so much is that if I'm not entertaining, you don't watch me and you don't learn anything. So I've got to be entertaining to educate. Uh, but yeah, conservation is definitely what it's all about. I think people don't conserve what they don't like. So my job is to get people to like more things that they might not even know exist. Awesome. So what, what, what thing, what topics or characteristics of animals or what they do, how they behave, what they look like, anything like that. What do you find sh like strikes the most, uh, with people, like what gets them most interested and, and watching and engaged? Yeah. So, so in terms of the videos that I do, reptile stuff definitely leads the way. Uh, I think partially just because the reptile community is so yeah. probably more internet savvy that, than somebody like wildlife care is. So it's a lot more shareable. Uh, but even for non-reptile people, anything venomous snake related straight away pikes up interest. I think people yeah, who I've don't like venomous snakes. <laughs> yeah, people who don't like venomous snakes, they still want to watch. It, it's uh, kind of like the car crash factor. You know, the mm. reason people slow down to, to see an accident, they want to, there's a, a curiosity about dangerous stuff. Uh, and I try to present my venomous snakes in a way that doesn't, you know, we're not very sensational or anything, but there's still just something in people's mind about venomous snakes. So that definitely gets the most interest of all my videos. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, f I find that a lot, like, especially with your, like a lot of your highest videos, a lot of them are to do with dangerous situations. Like I know there's that one I see pop up a lot of my recommended. It's the, um, the one with Usain Bolt running in the, the thumbnail and the crocodile and stuff, which I think is just great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so the crocodile, uh, what was it? Uh, how fast can a crocodile run on land? And, you know, it's, do crocodiles, can crocodiles outrun you? Which is something I used to hear doing crocodile shows uh, in North Queensland. And, you know, long story short, if, if I can outrun a crocodile, anybody can outrun a crocodile. Um, <laughs> But after that, I think, you know, we, we did one. We talked to, to Nathan from uh, Australian Pythons and Other Reptiles about his taipan bite. And that's, you know, a really popular video. Uh, mm. We've got a lot of taipans, um, a tiger snake video, that sort of stuff. Yeah, venomous snakes and crocs just gets people interested. I've got to try and sneak 
pygmy possums and kingfishers in amongst that stuff just so that people <laughs> people stick around and see it. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I love about your channel. You, you're trying to bring a lot of awareness to lesser known um, conservation issues, like really threatened species and stuff that people just don't know about, um, which is really awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, anybody watching, you know, your videos would probably be animal savvy enough to know you have got the worst conservation track record on earth, basically. Um, and, and it's common knowledge, but the sad thing is most Australians, even animal people, don't know just how much diversity we've still got that's at risk. You know, you start talking kawaris and mulgaras and, you know, honey possums and stuff. Even people who are interested in animals don't know what they are. So um, I try and reel people in with pipans and death adders and uh, <laughs> teach them about the mountain pygmy possum in between. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, you've got to really optimise you know, bringing them in with something a bit more flashy and crazy <laughs> and then, yeah, educating at the same time. It's, no, nah, it's, it's a hard, hard balance <laughs> to try and achieve, but I think you're doing a great job of it, mate. Yeah, I, I think it's, some people out there are watching, we've obviously got people tuning in each week, so, um, and I've, I've sort of deliberately steered towards that conservation, biology, natural history, um, you know, and we're starting to touch on husbandry and stuff a little bit, but just my niche has always been that. Mm. And if people want to know how do I care for this or, or whatever, I, I can push them towards people like you and, you know, Camp Cannon over in the States. And there's so many husbandry people who do it so well mm. that wildlife is, and conservation has been sort of my side of it, I suppose. That's fair enough, yeah. And like you said, you're in your past, you worked as a zookeeper and stuff like that, so... You probably this is definitely your field, like educating the public, and you, you'd probably have tons of content ready to go. You just have to make it, like with all the things people have said to you over the years, no doubt, like some crazy stories and stuff. So <laughs> it's yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I, like I, I've worked, you know, in a several several zoos and wildlife parks. So I, I spent some time fauna spotting, catching wildlife for outback mine sites. So I got no shortage of you know crazy things that people have said to me. Um, it's just getting to the point where I can have the animal in the video to, to make that video flow. <laughs> but yeah, we've got a, a big storyboard full of ideas. Just need to make them all happen. That's awesome. And then obviously your YouTube's all to uh, sort of uh, gain awareness towards your public displays and stuff. So when you, what are you doing those public displays? Do you, do you find it hard to get people engaged or... Um, like, do you let people pat certain animals and stuff like that? Is it, what's, what are you, how are your methods to sort of get people across that barrier if they might be afraid or just unsure? Yeah. So we certainly don't have too many issues with engagement, you know, like we, um, all our stuff is, you know, within reason, pretty hands on. Um, people can hold just about any non venomous animal we have, uh, with the exception of things like the wombat. She's just so heavy that everybody can pat her or give her a scratch. But yeah. You know, all that stuff is people pat, they get a hold. And depending on the size of the show, like at a birthday party, 15 kids can all have a hold of something. Mm. I can't pass a snake around 2,000 people at the Melbourne show. But everybody will get a pat. So we're really that's hands awesome. on. Um, with regards to like getting people who are scared or something, uh, that just takes practice reading people. You know, you've got to read animals and you've got to read yeah. people. Um, so, you know, it's as simple as we start off with a children's python and we'll work our way up. By the end of the day, they're holding an olive python or something. So. Awesome. Uh, most people come around pretty well. That's great. And what, what sort of age demographic do you find is most interested? <laughs> um, from like from birthday parties and, like, and kids, uh, that sort of 11 to, to 14 is like the, the kid that's, you'll, you'll have 10 of them who aren't, you know, they want to pat and they want to walk off. But yeah. then you'll have that, that kid who's absolutely obsessed and got no filter. So you'll have a million <laughs> questions from, which is, is cool. You know, like yeah. it, it's kind of cool to see a miniature version of what I was yeah, 20 absolutely. years ago. <laughs> um, but it's also, you know, some of my best shows are when we've done like land management groups and stuff like that, where you can suddenly get a lot more scientific and in-depth mm. than, than you could talking to a bunch of children at a, a birthday party without losing them. Uh, so yeah, the displays are, are certainly the big part of it, and our video started out to get attention to the displays, but obviously at the moment we can't do any displays, so it sort of comes full circle, yeah. 
and um, the, the videos uh, are becoming the most important part of what we do. That's awesome. Yeah, really cool. But um, so with, with the displays and stuff like that, how you obviously have certain animals you use for that. And I imagine there's certain, a lot of animals at home that you probably don't bring along because they might not exactly have the right temperament or whatever. So what do you look for in, in a lot of your demonstration animals and, and, and all that? Yeah. So I get, I get given quite a few uh, animals each year is like where people have them as pets and they've lost interest or their kids have moved out and mum and dad are stuck with it, that sort of thing. And they're usually the common stuff, lots of bearded dragons and carpet yeah. pythons. And, and I've sort of gone a, a funny loop. I, when I started, I had all that stuff because it's what was accessible to me. And then I sort of thought, oh, that's boring and I need to get, you know, things that people can't see at a pet shop. And, and now it's come full circle where I'm like, I can have a 14 foot scrubby and I'll get the same reaction with an eight foot coastal carpet python. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll bring the carpet python. But with selecting individual animals, probably maybe one third of the animals that I either purchase or trade or, or get, you know, come to me needing homes, about one third of them end up, you know, being completely interactive where they need to be, you know, they can be held and patted and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, there's no official rule, but our sort of guideline that we follow is I'll start them off when I do venomous snake shows. Everything will start off when I do the introduction on behind the pit. I can handle anything that's not used to all these people gawking at them. Mm. Uh, and then they'll work up to, you know, a, it sounds crazy, but school is the first thing I start them off handling because they're all sitting down and I've got two teachers to yell at them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll start schools, they're controlled. Uh, and it's probably 12 months before anything's being held by the public at a, a less controlled situation, like a, a show where people can come and pat and walk off without listening to this is the rules and this is how we do it. And, uh, and yeah, about a third of them make, you know, get up to that. Uh, mm. Some of the animals that don't, they still stay with us because either I get attached to them or, or they might be useful for other things. Some species or some individuals that aren't good to be passed around a big show, I still might be perfect for if I'm doing a biology class in year 12 yeah. to tackle a topic. So a lot of them fit in like that. And then a few of them end up as, you know, class pets and stuff for places where we go as well. So Awesome. Yeah. So I imagine a lot of those other extra animals are obviously great for videos as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so most of the animals, but well, most of the animals in our, most of our early videos are all animals that we own. Um, we're now getting to a point where I've filmed most of what I, <laughs> what I own. Um, so we're starting to like after the bushfires we went to Adelaide we filmed with koalas and care and mm. kangaroos and stuff like that um, but if you watch for any length of time you'll see the same regulars pop up the same type end popped up for about you know two years and um, the wombats usually a hit <laughs> so yeah yeah well it's animals like that you know that everyone knows and they're never going to get sick of those so you're lucky there yeah <laughs> Yeah, some of the ones where, you know, they can put a name to and people actually remember that wombat. It's not just a wombat. Um, but yeah. So is it very, like, time-consuming having all these and, you know, managing that and shows? And I imagine you do other things with your life as well. So is it a big, yeah. big time <laughs> waste or not waste of time consumer? <laughs> yeah, so it, it takes up a fair amount of my time. I could... Realistically, I could probably be a lot more efficient. I could probably go tub racks and newspaper and uh, save a lot more time. And that's that's totally fine for people who do that. I've got no issues with it. But uh, I'm pretty old school. It's all just wooden vivariums and um, just it's the way I've always been. Um, but it means I take a lot more time. Um, yeah. I work full time on a, a sheep property as well. And we run our own property on top of that. So... Um, yeah, I, I do seven days a week, almost 365 days a year up until now when suddenly our, our shows aren't going on. So yeah, right. We don't take many holidays. Welcome to the world of animals. <laughs> Non-stop. Yeah. Far out. That's um, it. But no, that's great that you're so, you know, passionate about it and, you know, you're really willing to spend all that time with it because, yeah, it's, you're doing a great service. Yeah, thank you. I, I think, you know, I'm... When I was a kid and when you were a kid, which was probably more recently than when I was, but, um, you know, I would have loved to be able to just crunch it into the, the computer and see all like unlimited, basically amateur documentaries, mm. you know, um, 
I remember when I was like 16, having to wait for four times a year to go to the reptile club meetings. That was the reptile fix. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like between you and, and Jake and Nathan and me, and, and then the big guys, you know, it, 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 it'd it be pretty cool to be getting into it now. Mm. Um, so I think we yeah, that's, that's something I, I, I look at a lot with myself and stuff. Like I look at my videos and your videos and stuff and I'm like, I would have loved to watch this as a kid. <laughs> like, yeah. This is exactly what I would have loved. I would have just sat in my room for ages and watched it all and soaked up all the knowledge, you know? It's awesome. Yeah, that's it. especially like, you know, everybody learns differently and, and I don't um, don't have the attention span to read book after book like a lot of people do. And that's the, the traditional way that, you know, people used to do it. Um, to have video content available to everybody is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I got through uni barely, but um, watching videos on YouTube and stuff, it's it's a great way to easily absorb information because it's not it's not hard to do. You know, it's so easy to sit back and suddenly you you know a bunch of things. And down the track, you know, people ask you a question. Oh, what's this animal? What what's that? Blah blah blah. And you're suddenly like, oh, I know this because I saw that video. You know, it's like it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I think for me watching videos, it almost becomes subliminal. You'll you'll get you'll hear that question one day and you'll spread out the answer and be like, Where where do yeah. I know that from? Hundred <laughs> percent, yeah. Been there many times. That's awesome. But yeah, it's great with the technology nowadays and yeah, I'll have to come down there sometime and film a bunch with you. Yeah, yeah, bring a jumper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet it's getting cold now, there now. Come springtime it's it's pretty good luck. Like, there's Hamilton itself is not exactly wildlife wonderland, but we're in a good spot where we can go an hour north and you can start to find laces and eastern bearded dragons, and you can go a little bit south and you're at Tower Hill, which has you know probably the biggest population of patternless tiger snakes in Australia. Awesome. So you know as many as you know maybe one third of the tiger snakes in parts of the southwest are, are patternless. Um, I'm forever wow. trying to tell locals that they're not brown snakes. You know. They're yeah. Really, yeah. Um, and There's a new video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've actually, I've actually got my hands on on a patentless tiger snake now. So I've been putting it off because I, I, I want the snake in my hands to do the video, and and yeah. I've now got a little Perfect. one and a, a bigger one. So uh, that'll be coming out soon. Awesome. And yeah, that's a good segue into what is your, like your future plans and you know goals and aspirations for both your business, Wicked Wildlife, and like the channel side of it as well. Oh, well, I suppose, you know, like, like every reptile keeper on earth, if I won the lottery, I'd, I'd start a place that people can come and, and see my animals. But um, realistically, in between now and then, uh, I'd like to grow the channel to the point where we can visit more facilities. You know, if we get a, an audience big enough that I can approach zoos and stuff and say, look, can we do a video with, um, I really want to film the, the Western Swamp Tortoise at Adelaide Zoo. Yes, um, that would be amazing. You know, things like that. But, but if, they're going to spend you know half a day with one of their staff with you you need to be able to say look you're going to have maybe ten thousand people watch this um yeah. so to grow it's work to for both parties can... yeah yeah that's it you can't expect them to just give you know they're a business mm. um so to grow to the point where we can start you know visiting other facilities and filming other animals would be a big thing and uh to grow the physical side of the business to the point where i can do that pretty well full time would be the dream awesome yeah good goals to have and yeah that's that's the big thing getting the views up and everything so then you can can branch out more and find more animals and it it, at the end of the day it's a net positive result for the animals themselves because you're getting the awareness out there you're getting people to know you know what it is what its issues are in the wild or whatever and yeah at the end of the day it's just going to benefit the animals and the wildlife yeah that's it so like you said it's all about you know growing growing the audience but at the same time i think sticking to your, your principles like a lot of you'd see it as much as anybody else yeah. a lot of youtubers fall into that pet tuber <laughs> you know where they're buying more animals mm-hmm. just because they want to put out a video and my rule before i started youtube like as a business was always we will never keep and display animals that i don't have a personal interest in so if somebody comes to me and they want to know about marine wildlife and and people pay for this stuff i'll put them on to, to xavier Marillo, wildlife exposure the guy's a marine biologist yeah. Speak to him, you know, it's his stuff. So I, I've always said I don't want to be buying stuff just 
because it, it'll make a good video and and not falling into that sensational mm. you know let's provoke things and get bitten by stuff just it happens you have animals you're gonna get bitten by something but um you know you don't want to be the guy getting tagged for views mm. um, and that's like the, the double-edged sword i suppose of youtube like doing all yeah. those things you know bringing in the hundreds of animals you know doing the deadly stuff with the snakes or whatever like it's gonna get a ton of views and you know it's gonna and it's so tempting but end of the day you gotta you gotta remember what you thought when you started and you know what you want to see yeah yeah it, it's it's funny like I'm, I'm friends with um dingo over in south africa he's mm. giving me a bit of advice but he's always telling me you know your snakes are too tame like you gotta <laughs> be exciting i'm like well they're tame because i i need to be able to talk to people while i handle yeah. these animals so um and not get a you know, life-threatening it, it, bite in the process <laughs> that's it it's, so it's they the reactions are exactly what they're like it's they just they are what they are so yeah. and the animal should be exciting enough as is so that's what i've always thought absolutely but yeah the way you all you tie it all together you know the, the cool facts about the animals the conservation side of it and just how awesome they are in their own right is yeah why i love your channel and why it's why it's growing nicely like it is yeah thank you i try and and you know when i write out a video um i don't want to say a script video because like you should be able to know all your facts but i try and mm. fact check everything because there's always somebody wanting to you know pick out that oh, one yeah. thing yeah that you, you miss <laughs> um so i write out you know out of general knowledge and what i know and then i'll go and double check everything and you try and put it in an order where it's uh it flows um you know a lot of people who might know a billion facts aren't good at passing them on so yeah the way that it presents is yeah. important it's really a a finely tuned craft you have there with your delivery of information it's uh i'm, I'm quite jealous of how well you, you how good you are at it but i suppose it comes down to years of um you know educating public on wildlife and stuff like that is that how you'd say you got that sort of ability to speak to people like that well i was actually on my first job i was working at a pet store when i was 14 and i lost my job because i didn't have the people skills to, uh. to deal with customers um so I, I basically you know when i wanted to be a zookeeper you've really got to be you either need a niche like birds of prey or you need to be able to, to engage with the public yeah um so when i started zoos I, I used to trade off my behind the scenes job for shows and and try and perfect and hone that craft and there's a long way to go like there's some amazing showmen out there mm -hmm. uh but yeah i think i've put a lot a lot of time and effort into it to how do i present its importance to me awesome yeah well you do a great job of it now mate um you've come a long way since the pet shop <laughs> yeah. yeah um and that's another point um what what would you say to because i we get a lot, a lot of young people watching our channels obviously um what's your sort of advice to them in regards to working with wildlife as a as a job you know yeah um i've got two sort of things the first one is don't be disheartened if you're not an academic like i know you know you you made it through your uni degree i was not so uh, such a good student <laughs> i did six months of uni and, and and i left and i still made it into zoos and wildlife park yeah it's still 100 um, percent possible be, yeah yeah that's it there's always another way in it, it might mean you've got to go and find some smaller parks and learn on the job more like a trade but you know don't think i'm not academic i can't be a zookeeper the other common mistake in like young kids is they go i want to be a tiger keeper or <laughs> you know i <laughs> um work with whatever you can like it sounds crazy but the pet shop mm. was good stuff for zookeeping uh agriculture farming half the keepers at werribee zoo have an agricultural background because it's a free-range zoo it's basically paddock maintenance so any animal job and especially dirty hands-on yeah. stuff um, when, especially private parks, they don't have, you know, ground staff like a Taronga Zoo or something does, you know, they look at your resume and, and we've both got the same stuff, but I can prove that I'm willing to get my hands dirty mm. and mix cement and pour paths and, you know, you're going to get, go a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that it's really, it's not all fun and games. You don't just get to sit there and play with the animals all day. It's uh, a lot of the time you're just, you know, shoveling some. 
there's an awful lot of handling poop and not as much cuddles as people might think, especially especially if you're going to be a reptile keeper. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of changing out paper. Yeah, 100%. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, thanks for that. And thanks for coming on. We'll probably try and end it there because it looks like you're fading into yeah. nothing. <laughs> I've started to disappear into the background. <laughs> yeah, well... Thanks again, mate. And uh, it's been great talking to you. Make sure you guys check out his channel. Amazing channel. Lots of great wildlife videos. He has a lot of cool reptiles, uh, which obviously make a lot of appearances, including, you know, a lot of cool venomous snakes. And uh, do you still have the crocodile? I remember you, ha you having a crocodile at one point. Yeah, we we've got a couple of crocodiles. Um, yeah, right. We've got a freshie, a salty, and we've got a freshie that's boarding with us at the moment from a wildlife park that's had to close down over COVID sort of stuff. So there's three crocs that's on our awesome. place at the moment. Far out. Yeah. That's a bit of a dream there. But um, <laughs> yeah, so make sure you check out Nick over at Wicked Wildlife on YouTube and you'll see some awesome animals like that as well as a lot of cool facts and a really good presenter and a very nice dude. He's a legend. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks for coming on, mate. And I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.